everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Eduardo, and uh, today I will talk about a subject that's very dear to my heart, which is MLOps, and why DevOps is lacking in the machine learning world. Uh, my name is Eduardo Bonet. I'm Brazilian. I've been living in the Netherlands for a few years already, six years. Uh, and I am a staff incubation engineer at GitLab. I'll explain what it, a staff incubation is uh, later. Uh, but yeah, I've been on GitLab for uh, two years right now. Uh, I know a quick overview of, of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, first, uh, just give the names to things. We're going to talk about what is MLOps. Then I'll try to start the, the conversation about some examples of where DevOps solutions or the platform teams have been failing uh, data scientists. And then explain a bit on why uh, there is this difference and how we at GitLab are tackling this issue. Finally, a quick word about LLMOps, which is the new kid uh, in the playground. Um, what is MLOps and why is it and how is it different from uh, DevOps? DevOps is not a technology. ML, uh, DevOps is a, is a culture, is a set of uh, processes or techniques or ways that you use to improve the quality of your deliverables, the quality of the software uh, that you put out to the users. So it's not only about coding, but it starts all on the agile part and how you create that, uh, that software, how you plan that software, deploy, monitor, so on and so forth. And MLOps is pretty much the same in, the, in, uh, in its idea. Uh, it's about creating together uh, software that includes some parts that are powered by machine learning features. So that is the only difference on the definition between DevOps and MLOps. So MLOps is not just after something is created. It's the whole process of creating, planning, uh, packaging, deploying, verifying, securing uh, the whole uh, loop, which I won't talk. Um, so I was a data scientist before joining GitLab. I was a machine learning before engineer before joining GitLab. So I spent a few work years working uh, on this realm, and there was always a discussion or some uh, misunderstandings when we had to deal with the platform team and what the toolings that we would need. I'm going to share some some examples of what happened in the past. I was working for this uh, large company. We were about 300 data scientists. And to configure our data pipelines, we had something called Uzi, uh, which is the Hadoop uh, orchest pipeline orchestrator. And it wasn't good in itself. There was nothing special about it. But we had this workflow that would find existing code, copy, change uh, to create our new pipelines. And it would work perfectly well for us. At some point, uh, it was decided by a platform team that they shouldn't support this anymore, and they would provide a different solution, which was something that would rely on, uh, would be built upon on their platform for uh, microservices, and each pipeline would be a microservice that would be owned by a team, which sound pretty on paper, and for software engineers, it was great. But for data scientists, that didn't solve any of their problems. Like, they had no problems with the tool, and it just added so much into their workflow that this happened four years ago, and they're still using Uzi, Uzi, even though there was a lot of investment to change, because it solved no, one pro no one's problem. That didn't solve the platform team tried to solve their problem and not the data scientist problem. Another one. Another issue that, uh, that I faced a lot as well was data scientists use uh, Jupyter Notebooks uh, for their flow. For those that don't know, it's kind of a file where you code and then you see the result of the code and you can iterate over this code over there and everything is saved into the notebook itself. Which, when you tell this to software engineer, they go crazy because you're putting output and input together and you're trying to pu push this to Git. Uh, it sounds like blasphemy to have output on Git. I like to have the final output of what you're coding into Git. Like, Git should be only for code or whatever. But what happened is that Jupyter Notebooks are important for the data science flow. 
it solves a problem for data scientists because we need to see the, the output of, of the graph that you generated. Discussing that graph is as important as discussing the code uh, that was created. The code is not even that important in the whole uh, sense of what we're, we are doing. Yet, over and over, there's this resistance of, of, of pushing tooling that makes software engineer, brings software engineer practices into the data science platform. I even heard, like, when uh, recently uh, a company released uh, notebooks, diffs, like uh, code reviews, and I saw a tweet that said, oh, I wish you didn't have done this because that means there's one less reason against notebooks now because they just didn't want notebooks at all. Like, they, they just want to abolish. Another one, this happened with me as well. Um, I needed to deploy a model, but the platform team was asked for a MLOps platform and they deployed Kubeflow, which is a great platform, but it doesn't have a model registry. I came back to them, okay, but we, I, we, I don't have this component that I need. But they didn't take the time to understand what are the components in that tool. They just said that this is an end-to-end, -end, so it should have everything, and you're good to go. So if you don't have what you need, it's probably, beca probably because you don't, are not using this in the right way. Um, yeah. And finally, this is the most, uh, this is like a rite of passage for every data science, data scientist trying to deal with, uh, with a platform team in the beginning. We need production data in the development environment. Why? Because models depend on data. And if you don't have, if you have only development data, like test data, you cannot build models and you cannot test those models. So you need production data. Um, and there's always, every time we say this to, to a platform team, like there is, you can see the cogs running, like why is this happening? Why am I in this conversation? So there were two th things on these uh, examples that, are, that I showed. First, why de is DevOps or platform, platform things fail, failing the, the machine learning world? First, it's failing to understand the who. The people that are involved with developing machine learning are different than the people that are involved with developing with software engineer. They have different backgrounds, different ideas. And second, failing to understand the what. Even though the goal is the same, we are trying to build better software, we are trying to build, uh, to deliver more value to the user, developing software that includes machine learning is fundamentally different than develop, developing regular software. I'm gonna show why in a second. Why, and then, now why is, Different. Why is there this? Why is this? This is a difference. The first that I mentioned is the who. Data scientists are not software engineers. We are still trying to develop software engineering solutions to data scientists, but they are not software engineers. They are a different crowd. They have different background. So the most data scientists that I've worked with, at least, don't come from a computer science background. They come from philosophy, from uh, geology, from chemistry, from uh, econo uh, eco econometrics, it's one of the most unique crowd, like most diverse crowd that I've uh, have ever worked with after, uh, uh, even after being a uh, software engineer. And within those folks, code is not a craft. For, the, for software engineers, the final, one of the final delivers is code, but for data scientists, that is not the case. For some of them, the, the deliverable is an analysis, so there are some data scientists which are focused on helping business make decisions, and the others are more, uh, work more on machine learning and product that use data science, and for those, it's the, the final artifact is a model or anything, or, or something like that, but the code itself, for them, is a way to get there. It's not the final. I, I see a lot of software engineers that have as a hobby trying to prove their code base or learning new patterns of how to code or anything, that is not the case for data scientists. You see this by this how the community inter, uh, interacts. The whole community kind of like flocked into a single language. Everybody kind of uses either Python and some, uh, some people use R, but there's not this spread of languages that you see. Not only that, everybody flocks into the same libraries within the same language. You have like a few dozen libraries that everybody uses, and it's not like everyone is trying to create new libraries all the time. This happens this creation of new things, this new, 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 new happens on the models, on the, on the algorithms, on the new ideas, but not on the code. 
So they are, not, they are not worried about the same things that software engineers do. They have different incentives. Uh, and they have this low tolerance when installing new tooling. Like they don't want to uh, set up and install and go through a uh, hundred hoops, a hundred uh, stack overflow answers to try to figure out how to set up that small thing. So they, they just want something that works for them. Thus, a lot of the data scientists still use Excel for, uh, for, some, uh, for, for, for use case or Jupyter or, or whatever. And while we don't understand, we don't capture this, while develop solutions, uh, either point solutions or, or, or platforms don't understand that the folks are different that we are developing for, um, we're still gonna continue failing them. And the second difference is the what. Why is developing software with machine learning different than software with data science? When you're working with, uh, with regular software, this is a gross, uh, a, a very big uh, generalization of software, but you take some input data, you pass it through your code that encodes your logic, and the outcome is some behavior, transforms the data into some behavior. Uh, this can be show something on the screen, uh, save something to the database, whatever, but this is, but the important part is that the logic is explicit in the code. When you, you write software, you are writing the logic. When you code review software, you are not calling code reviewing uh, the specific letters, that are, words that are there. You're actually looking at the logic, trying to go through the logic uh, to see uh, what would become the behavior. So it's explicit. The process of input to the output is explicit in the code. For machine learning, that doesn't hold. When you're working with machine learning, you pick some training data, so a collection of data that you're looking at, and it might or might not have some logic, but you can only see the patterns of this data. So you write some code to extract these patterns. Extracting these patterns from the data will generate a model that will have its own logic in itself. And then you pass input data for the behavior. The difference here is now that the logic is implicit. You don't have that explicity that you had before uh, on, on the data. The, the, the logic here is, is implicit. You don't even know if the logic is correct. And this changes everything. This is just like uh, this fundamental difference changes everything about the software, about the development of machine learning. One, extracting those patterns can be really expensive. Uh, you can, by thinking not uh, an hour, thinking pipelines that run for days, that they consume GPU for days, months even. The code that you write to extract pattern, it's, it does that, it extracts pattern. But you're not even sure if the pattern is useful until you, you go into the production data. You have some approximations of, of, of the effectiveness of, of the model but you only know if it is really doing what it's supposed to do on production data, with A-B testing, with shadow deployment, and other forms of, so you go in the dark for a long time. The learned patterns are about the data itself. So if the underlying data changes, which happens all the time, users change their preferences, they get tired of whatever uh, TV shows they are watching and they want something different, or music, or whatever, they will get stale, and you, keep to you have to keep retraining models. So it's, you have to deploy new versions even though the code didn't change. The code is just one aspect of, of the machine learning model. The data is as important as the code itself, even more so. Um, like I said, developing environment uh, requires production data. Why? The model is a reflection. Again, the model is a reflection of the input data. If you have uh, we call it uh, trash in, trash out. If you have trash input data, you're gonna have a trash output model. If you have only test data or, or fake data for test, you're gonna have a model that you can even really test. There's no point in testing that in the end. There is some, uh, some ways to do this with synthetic data, but either way, to generate synthetic data, you're gonna need some examples of your production data. And data also, like I said, data is, is as important as the code. How do, you version the, how do you version the data? This is a challenge that we've been going through forever and there's no good tooling. There are some toolings around, 
but they managed to be even more complicated than Git. Um, so you can imagine you show this to, somebody, to, to a group of people that don't want to try to, uh, tooling that's too complex, and uh, you're going to see the adoption of this kind of thing. And another one, testing code is really hard. You can test explicitly, uh, but how do you run unit tests when the output is by definition probabilistic? Like you, you're trying to get the most probable thing, but 5% of like if your code has 5% uh, 95% accuracy, 5% of the cases will fail gross, uh, in general just because of the data. So you're going to have a lot of flaky tests. How do you manage those? Developing is different here, both the who and the what. Um, and trying to cram in all the time existing solutions into this workflow is not really doing uh, what it's supposed to do. And how are we tackling this? Um, like I said, I'm an incubation engineer uh, at GitLab. An incubation engineer is the first investment of GitLab into a specific area. And my area that, uh, that I am incubating into GitLab is uh, MLOps. So I was mentioned I was a data scientist, I was machine learning, and I was a software developer that used to love GitLab, and then I became a data scientist that had no, not much use for it. And I want to understand why that. And I joined GitLab to start fixing this. So first and foremost, we divided GitLab, like DevOps has gone through a few different eras or phases. You started with, you have a culture, of course, but you need tooling for to implement this culture. And what, the first step of DevOps was a lot of different unique point solutions for specific problems. But then you spend a lot of time implementing each one of these specific solutions, uh, and you couldn't create uh, an ecosystem. Then it came with the standardized tool chains. Each one of these point solutions created APIs that could connect to each other, uh, that allowed at least communication and some level of integration, but that integration and communication fell into the users. So there was a lot of time spent implementing glue code uh, to get them to work together and failing at that, of course, uh, because, well, if one changes, then you have to keep sync and it's annoying. And then the third phase is the digital tuck tape, or what I call the stitchers. Companies that have managed instance of different products and already create the, 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 the connection between them, already implement the, the, this for you. But there's a problem with this one as well, which is you still have, like, even though it's implemented, you still have to learn N tools uh, for your, to do your job. So even though it's already there for you, you still have to learn each of them, each of their UX, if each of their wordings, each how anyone calls, like each of them call each thing. And MLOps is now getting at the second level. We've gone, we are going through like point solutions. We are now getting some standardized uh, tool chains so that they can communicate with each other. And some vendors are on the, on the teacher level. But we want to be different. The fourth phase of, of DevOps is the platform. It's not a Stitcher. It still provides all the solutions, everything connected, but with the same user interface, uh, with the same language across the whole process of development. So you don't need to learn everything, I like all different tools. You just you have one language across the whole team. This is a, one, one slide that I will read because it's, it makes sense to read this one. Um, so Dev, GitLab is the DevOps platform, but our vision is that it will also become the MLOps platform. GitLab MLOps platform is a single application powered by a cohesive user interface, agnostic of self-managed or SaaS deployment. It is built on a single code base with a unified data store, allows organizations to resolve inefficiency and vulnerabilities of unreliable, unreliable DIY toolchain. This is where we're going at. We want to create a, a platform for data scientists at the same place where they can collaborate with software engineers 
that helps them improve their flow from planning their work to creating their, their models, to packaging, to deploying, to monitoring across the whole stack. And this is what I mean. This is what GitLab is for the DevSecOps. We want to find on each one of these steps what is missing for data scientists. How can we improve this? And don't really push what is in there. Sometimes we already have the solutions. But we are lacking, and we need to know where and how to bridge this gap between what is there and, and this uh, new uh, user type that we wanna, you want to provide value for. So as I mentioned, what we want to do, a GitLab native experience. We don't want to just offer self-managed uh, uh, installations of other software that you still have to learn the language. We want to give a nat native experience from the beginning to the end. Minimal setup. Users need to do the least for everything to work. No changes to their code base as much as possible. No setup, no, I don't know, uh, installing something and trying to create a bucket or a uh, service to have that run. If it is, if you have access to GitLab, that should be working by default. The same language shared by the developers, by the product managers, or by the SREs and the data scientists. So everybody working together in the same tool, using the same language to remove communications efficiencies. Just the fact that you can share a notebook easily with your product manager is something wild for data scientists sometimes. And last but not the least, open source. GitLab is fully open source. Even uh, our, premium uh, uh, our premium future are open source. You can see what we're building. Uh, we build on the open. Uh, we are transparent on everything that we do along the way. And I said what we want to be. But I'm gonna, that's not enough, right? And I wanna show a little bit what I have, we, what I have been doing on the past few years uh, towards that vision. The first one uh, that I implemented was code reviews for Jupyter Notebooks. As I mentioned before, uh, it's a very weird file system. It's actually a JSON file uh, with everything crammed in. So it has like basics for images with HTML, with markdown, with coding itself. And what I did, I implemented a way to create these diffs and display along the regular GitLab diffs. So the data scientist doesn't need to do anything. They can steal whatever, uh, use, uh, whatever Jupyter notebook they were using. They don't need to install any library, anything. It will display over there. You can now uh, discuss on your code review images, uh, the code, the markdown, everything in a single place oh. using existing GitLab tooling. This was released already two years ago, 14.5. The second one, this is the, my most recent release, is model experiments. When you are developing a machine learning model, there, I, mentioned, there two, I mentioned two components, code and, and uh, data, but there's another one, which is hyperparameters, which is a pretty word for configuration file. Um, and we, since it's non-deterministic, the output of a machine learning model, we don't know what is the best of the configurations that we need. So what we do, we throw a lot of, uh, we, to test them across all possible configurations and find the best model. What, the, what the, the impact of this is that for every change that you make, you're gonna have this huge number of, of trials of candidates for models that you need to keep track of. What is the performance of which one? Which, what was the, the, what was the uh, metrics, the performance, the metrics, the parameters? What is the, the commit for that, that generated model? This is what uh, model experiments do. It's, it allows you to track down, to track this metadata, save the artifact of each model directly into GitLab. Um, it was released in 6.2. It's native to GitLab. And this is where it gets interesting. It uh, connects to CI pipelines, MRs, package registry. But now, this is what gets interesting. We could, the, the ML flow is the most common solution on the open source market. We could, and it was an idea initially, to just deploy MLflow that you could access through GitLab. But that wouldn't give the experience we want to give to users. So what we did, we re-implemented this into GitLab. It's native to GitLab with compatibility to the MLflow API. You can still use your MLflow client. You can still use the code that you already have. You will connect with just a change to the environmental variables. And you already connect to GitLab. And it will save everything into GitLab as 
GitLab act almost as a backend. No, almost no, it, it works as a backend to MLflow. But the beauty of this is now that it's really easy for us to integrate across the platform. If you run this from a CI pipeline, we will identify that, and we will show the, what, if there was an MR that triggered the creation of that model, this will show up over here. Um, user management, MLflow doesn't provide user management. On GitLab, this is, this is out of the box, because it's, every project has its experiments, so only users with access to that project will be able to see those experiments. And again, zero setup. If you have a, a GitLab installation, you don't need to do anything as a data scientist. It's already there. You, can, you just start using. If you already have a model experiment, if you already have uh, MLflow users, you don't even need to change your code. You just change how it's, uh, it's run, the, the environmental variable, to point to GitLab, and you're good to go. It will already start uh, saving into, uh, into MLflow, into GitLab. Again, it was really fun to build this. Uh, we had a lot of People coming in, of data scientists coming in, discussing the solutions, you still do. Um, every bug that someone reports, it means that somebody is using it, so it's a good thing. Uh, every feedback is really welcome on, on, this, on this feature. Now what we're building is the model registry. It's similar to model experiments, but model experiments is more a scratch pad for models where you store a lot of trials. And the model registry is how you, how you communicate to your application which models should be deployed for production. So it, say, it still saves everything into the GitLab package. It's like a package registry targeted for uh, the machine learning workflow. And another thing that's very interesting here for me on how this is being approached, when I started working on this, I thought, okay, this is gonna be a package registry. It's just gonna have a version and that's it. The, the logic for managing what is deployed should be from the application. But that not, that's not how data science do. They prefer, they want to be able to toggle which model is available directly on the screen. Uh, they want to tag each of the models, each of the versions, whether they are at staging, production, or dev. And we need to accommodate this use case. We, sometimes we can be a little opinionated, but we need to be weakly opinionated to our users. Uh, it needs to be uh, user-driven, um, and this is what we're going to do. This is development. If you have any ideas of how we could do a better job at this, 9423 is the, the epic of, of, of where we are discussing and keeping track of, of the evolution. And a final note about LLMOps, which is uh, hard to say. I trained for a while uh, before this talk, LLMOps, LLMOps, LLMOps. Um, yeah. Remember the drawing that I showed about the interaction of logic of, of machine learning? It gets worse when you're talking about, uh, about uh, LLMs. Worse because you still have that model, but that model receives a prompt, and the prompt plus the, mod, the, 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 the large language model becomes an app or something. And this app will receive the input data. So there's a second level of interaction here. There's a second level of, of implicitity. That's also a hard, hard word. Uh, on the development. And this will bring a whole set of different issues that MLOps has, is not covering so far. The LL, like this large language module hardly will be built by the company that is using it because it's really costly to build them. The training data is necessary, is very large and so on. So for the company, how, they, how do they audit this model that is coming in for them to use, for example? How do you measure across different models that are, that are appearing? Uh, how do you track these changes? What's in the data that was used for training this large? Prompt in itself is an artifact. Like we are right now, we are at a level that we're just writing prompts on the code and even on the front end code that I, I, I see sometimes and just praying that it's gonna work. But the, thing is that it's as an artifact as a, a binary or, and we need to be able to create a, a interface where not only software engineers but UX uh, writers and product managers and other folks involved on the, on the creation of this can edit and collaborate properly. Right now it's only on the code, a lot of places only on the code and we need to move away from this. 
So this is going to be a lot of fun uh, in the next few years, how to tackle this. We haven't even done MLOps properly yet, but we're already pushing the next phase. So that's, uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. Quick summary. We, MLOps is very similar to DevOps. Our goal is to create software faster uh, that solves users' actual problems in a way they want, in a secure way, in a, in a fast way. But DevOps is failing. It's not failing, but it's not enough at this point. And because the two main reasons that the person who they are developing for is different, and if we don't understand that, if DevOps doesn't understand them, they'll keep lacking. And second, uh, the what is different. There's a fundamental difference on how you see software with machine learning and how you need, and the task you need to do to verify that they work or not. Um, that's also need to be taken into account. And the current landscape of MLOps solutions are mostly point solutions with some emerging level of, 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 um, of, 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 of a, a interface between them uh, that is not there yet with a few vendors that try to connect all of them. And we are trying as GitLab to go the to already bringing the next step of becoming an MLOps platform uh, and create a cohesive user story, a cohesive platform where you can develop software with or without machine learning and collaborate with your peers along the way, reducing uh, inefficiencies. Well, thank you. Well, again, my name is Eduardo, and if you want to know more, it's right over there on, uh, well, Everything is open. I have a handbook page about MLOps. If you want to check, just search for MLOps GitLab Eduardo Pone, and you're going to find that. That's the easiest way to find me. Uh, I'm also on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, I usually post my updates. I try to post updates every two, three weeks, and you're going to find them there. That's it. Questions? I think we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, thank you, thank you for the talk, Eduardo. Um, so uh, my first question would be around uh, data versioning. So how do you thought about applying any Git principles or concepts to how you version the machine learning artifacts? Um, I've been thinking about this. That we have an issue discussing uh, this support. My question that I have right now is, is Git principles valid for data? Is something that like the most, most of the solutions that we have for anything versioning, somebody think, says versioning, somebody on the other side like, screams Git. Uh, but we don't know, Git is made to track changes in text, in raw text. This is what Git is good for because it allows also in software to track logic. Is Git enough for data science? What would be the right, like it's the tool that we have, but it is, it is the right tool for data science. Um, and for, for data versioning, that question is even more important. What will be the right tooling for, for? We could, and probably what we will do, is support existing tooling that Git, but we are trying to also go further to see if like, the underlying uh, solution uh, is the correct one. But there is, uh, there is an issue that we're discussing this on GitLab. It's, it's an open question. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Uh, question. So in, in this machine learning ops provided by GitLab, does it provide management uh, of data side and uh, models? This, for models, this is the model registry that is coming up. Uh, so the model registry is how you manage models, like the mm -hmm. versions. And once we have model registry in place, the next step on the circle is to work on deployment, on deployment of these models that you, that you registry on the model uh, registry. So once we have model registry in place, then uh, it becomes deployment, and then trying to start implementing verification of machine learning models. Like, what does it mean supply uh, to, what does supply mean attacks, for example, mean on, uh, for machine learning? Uh, data injection and things like that, which is also on the scope of what we're going to look at, uh, take a look next. 
eventually. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know if anyone else has any other questions, but yeah, if not, um, have you started working or designing the serving states that would come after, I guess, after the model catalog? Sorry? So the serving and deployment of models. This will come once the, the model register is in place. Uh, the serving is the next step. We have some ideas already. I have already started discussing with the teams. So I'm trying to get other teams also to see this problem and uh, work. We have a team specifically for deploy. Uh, so I'm discussing how to, to work for deployment of machine learning models. What does it mean not only to have them deployed, but also on merge requests? How do you test? Do you see that you, you can test, like on, uh, on Hugging Face, you can see the thing. You could also see this on merge requests. Uh, how do you monitor those? And do you use Kubernetes or not? How do you deploy uh, the things? So this is, this is on the scope. I think I'm going to create an issue already. Uh, to start collecting some ideas around that, uh, that, 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 to explore that next step. Thank you. More questions? Yeah. No? May I ask uh, another question? Yeah. So, uh, in this platform, I would say, uh, could I use these machine learning ops to deploy my own large, large language models based on the computing resources provided by this platform? Yes, um, you could. We have, uh, there is a limitation on the size of the files that you can have at GitLab uh, Artifact Registry, which is 10 gigabytes. Um, but we're trying, if you're on self-managed, that doesn't apply, but if you are on the, using the SAS, of GitLab, it's 10 gigabytes. So for some LMs, that's not enough. Um, and on our CI pipelines, we offer also GPUs uh, enable runners. So if you want to use GPUs for your runners, you could use that as well. If you're on self-managed, there are no limitations. Like you can use whatever your storage, so you can create your own. Uh, but you have not gone anyway on LLM ops itself. So prompt management and things, we have no products uh, we don't offer anything yet on that, but also something we are exploring. Uh, have you considering uh, integrate some out of box solutions into your machine learning ops, something like uh, long chain? Um, our API is pretty open uh, and pretty powerful. So a lot of what, to, what you can do at GitLab on the UI, you can do through an API. So it makes easy to integrate with other toolings. I don't know if that was the question you asked. I couldn't understand it end properly. Does that answer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we try to build everything as an API so that you can use whatever tool you're using uh, and still connect and still make use of GitLab uh, in some part of the to the things that we don't offer a solution yet or some solutions that we don't offer the full uh, experience that we, you would expect. Hello. Um, we work a lot on time series forecasting, mm -hmm. and um, we have a major subject, which is explainability. Mm -hmm. And um, is this something you will integrate in GitLab? Because it is very, very important. Uh, we use uh, today many tools. So mm -hmm. if GitLab integrates those solutions, it can be very. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we have not integrated exp explainability yet, um, and we want to provide a way to display the exp explainability of different tools. Like, we are not going to implement a library, a Python library that will compute the sharp values of, the, of, of, of your time series or whatever of, of your model, but we want you to be able to see those differences on GitLab, uh, to see, to be able to like, open your MR and see this new model that was generated, these candidates that were then generated, and see why they are, why, why are they behaving like that? What's the problem? We want to give that power of, uh, of some sort of report that, that, that you see on GitLab for, for the model creation. Yes, on MRs, on the model itself, on model experiments, for example, would be a good place to have this uh, the explainability for each of the artifacts that you generate. 
it is uh, it is the idea. How we're going to implement this? Uh, it's still being discussed, but it is something we want to provide. Yes. If you want, you can create an issue for this on GitLab and tag me, and then we start discussing that. Uh, it's the most uh, productive way uh, to, to to talk about this async as well, uh, and not just leave it here on this conversation on this presentation. Okay. An issue would be uh, the next step. Any more questions? Good. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for taking the time and watching this.